So we are moving through Acts, not necessarily sequentially. There may be some back and forth. So this last week, we, I think we were in chapter, what chapter was it? We were in four last week. Um, so this week, we're going to be back in two, and we're going to sort of make our way around and weave our way through Acts over the next couple of months. So beginning in the, at the start of chapter two, it says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven, living in Jerusalem. And at this time, at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. And listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> no, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know. This man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. I'm skipping ahead to 32 now. This Jesus God raised up and of that all of us are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you both see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make 
your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, they, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. That's a long passage, I know. Um, even having skipped some of it, it's still pretty long. But it's important to have the whole flow of that, that story. Uh, the most... The most violent rush of wind that I've experienced was not in Lubbock, Texas, actually, but in the middle of summer 1995 in uh, upstate New York. I was 15. We experienced what's called a microburst all around northern New York. It was a series of small, intense tornadoes that exploded across the landscape. I was at camp for the week, a camp near uh, Syracuse called Camp Hunt, uh, where I would go every summer. And I was lying in a, a rickety old bunk bed, which sat in a rickety old rectangular cabin built from two by fours and a single layer of plywood, uh, surrounded by tall pines. And I remember thinking that day that the, the air felt strange underneath a blanket of clouds and that suddenly the world seemed to be coming to an end, that the cabin I was in might be crushed together at any moment. And then a couple of days later, when I returned to my hometown, Watertown, I saw the aftermath of the wind that had torn through this city that was lined, densely packed, with 40 and 50 foot trees, many of which now lay prostrate, their limbs and leaves broken and scattered, blanketing the streets. This is one of those memories that washes over me whenever I read this passage from the start of the book of Acts and try to imagine how the disciples must have felt, sitting together, not sure what to expect, not knowing where the story is headed exactly or how it's going to get there. They're waiting. They're observing this Jewish holy day, retelling and remembering the stories of wilderness and redemption, God's provision, stories and practices, remembrance that has defined their lives. And suddenly, like a freight train crashing through the wall, the calm, still air is overtaken 
by this violent wind that fills the house. With this story, the curtains are flung open for the story of Acts to begin in earnest. Now pause for a second and take note that Luke places this story here as one of his opening moves in a book that's meant to somehow convey to the readers, Jews and Gentiles, Christians and non-Christians, this book is meant to convey to all of them some sense of what the Christian community is all about. Who it is that they follow. What their lives, collectively and individually, are aimed towards. This book and the Gospel of Luke, together, are intended to do all of those things. Each story is one piece, one facet, one element in that broader whole, that broader effort. And sometimes he includes stories that are surprising and unpredictable. Stories like this one. This story that we in Churches of Christ are maybe a little too familiar with. So familiar that maybe we don't really notice it as it goes past us. Don't really let it sink in, in all its strangeness. So think first about these disciples. These disciples who were, from what we see in the Gospels, fearful, power-hungry, vengeful, resistant to a Gospel that led towards life somehow by way of crucifixion. These same disciples have now witnessed Christ's death and resurrection and ascension. And in the wake of those events, they are beginning to give themselves over to this message, unaware of exactly what it will look like. And as they're gathered together, the Spirit, the breath of God, comes and moves among them, fulfilling this prophecy from Joel, as Luke tells us. This prophecy about blood and fire and smoky mist, the sun turning to darkness, the moon turning to blood. Great upheaval is on its way and has arrived. But what will it look like exactly? Move with them through the story. The violent wind fills the space around them. What could possibly be next? What will be the aftermath? What will come in the wake of this spirit? Earthquakes, the ground splitting open, the sun shrouded in darkness, a world turned upside down. And yet as the story unfolds, we see that the great portents, the massive upheaval will not actually be in grand spectacle so much. Don't let the tongues of fire fool or distract you. They're not really the point of the passage, the tongues of fire. In the same way that spotlights and bookmarks are never themselves the point. They point to other things. The great miracle is not just that the disciples are receiving the Spirit, but that everyone else is receiving the Spirit. Everyone else is drawn in from across all these different walls of background and language. All these others who are so other, from a crowd of people that the disciples have every reason, every motive to condemn and detest. These people, many of whom quite possibly also joined another crowd a few days before this one and chanted for the crucifixion of Christ. Now they bear witness as that same man's disciples call out to them not with condemnation and hatred, but with a message of hope, of love, with a call toward new life. This is the work of the Spirit of God. This is the power of God working a wonder among them. And they are amazed and astonished, as the text tells us six different times. Luke, the writer, clearly wants to highlight this, to make sure the reader has a good, strong sense of disorientation. 
in the face of the real main event in the story. So let's sit with it for a second. I've mentioned before, when we've gone through Acts, that I think it's, it's significant that the story goes this way instead of other ways that it could have gone. For one thing, we have Jesus' disciples proclaiming the good news, not with threats of divine wrath and anger, but with a message of hope. In Christ, God has revealed God's ultimate victory over death. But there's more. The disciples of this Christ, this Messiah, are called to move through death to new life themselves, to take up their crosses and follow him. And so they do, as we see over the course of this book. Even here at the beginning, we see a glimpse of it. Notice that the miracle, the fulfillment of this prophecy revolves around bringing these foreigners, these others, who are from all these different places, and inviting them to the table. And this happens not by the Spirit enabling all of the others to understand the disciples' language, but the reverse. The disciples' message of hope is given over to be understood in the other languages. They are welcomed to the table precisely as the others, the foreigners, that they are. And I want to highlight that point for a second. The disciples who were power-hungry and status hungry, who could have at the very least said to these crowds, you must learn our language. You must look and act and be just like us. Instead, their language is given over to welcome these, other in, these others in. And they're giving themselves over to this gospel message in a way that they cannot predict and do not control. The message, the presence and power and work of the Spirit None of these things are under the control of the disciples. We see here in Technicolor that the Spirit blows where it wills. The Spirit is there even in these new translations of the good news, far beyond the borders and limits that the disciples might have imagined. And this is not a one-time event. It's only the beginning. The movement of the Spirit to create radical and surprising and uncomfortable hospitality is a central thread throughout the story, which means that it's a central thread in the life of the church, which means that we too are to expect and aim our lives toward and let our own lives together be characterized by that same kind of thing. Step back again to see this more clearly. Think about the role that these texts have played and are to play in our lives together. In the way that we think about who we are and what we're called to be and do. These are the stories that frame our lives. And if the stories that make up the books of Luke and Acts, among others, are meant to tell us who God is and what God cares about, what God was up to in the person, in the life and death and resurrection of Christ, who we're called to be as Christ's followers. If all of that is true, and if what we find in these texts is the Spirit generating radical hospitality, fellowship across all sorts of walls and boundaries, among people who give their lives over to each other in love. If that's what we find in these texts, and these texts are meant to shape our lives, then it follows that like the early disciples, we too must let the Spirit flow through us to create that same kind of self-giving love and fellowship. We too are called to give up the desire to limit the Spirit's presence and work to the times and places and forms that we are familiar and comfortable with. 
to let the Spirit move in us to create the sort of radical hospitality and fellowship that follow in the wake of the Spirit's work. Because we too are a part of that church. Of course, it's not always clear what this looks like. But one thing I think it means for the church is that we must always remember that the good news is still the good news, even if it's not being said in the translation we're familiar with. And the Spirit's work does not always look just like it did before. The Spirit is alive and present and active in surprising ways that are not limited to the boundaries that the church might expect or want to set. Instead, we must always be on the lookout for new translations, new iterations of the good news, new ways to submit ourselves, to give ourselves over to those around us. I think the writer of Colossians, we've heard from Colossians a couple of times already this morning. I want to read from chapter 3. I think the writer of this letter is expressing a lot of these themes over the course of a, a few verses in chapter 3. I'll close with this. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Amen.